God bless you guys. Um, so we're hanging in there. We're doing good here. And uh, it's been a, a really, really rough uh, few days, uh, of course, because of, of, of the latest uh, gun violence in uh, Uvalde, Texas. And uh, I, I told my people about this today in, uh, in, the, um, in my church service and my divine liturgy during, after my sermon. And I share this with uh, a clergy group that uh, here on the West Coast, we have a clergy meeting with all the clergymen of the metropolis of San Francisco once, once a week. And uh, I'll, I'm going to open up with sharing this and uh, just leave it for what it is. When I was in, as the priest in San Antonio, Texas, I used to regularly, perhaps once a month, drive to Uvalde from San Antonio to visit uh, a, a couple there, Pat and Paul Ifantis. Uh, Paul was from Eagle Pass. Texas, right along the border, across from Piedras Negras, and uh, and Pat was from Chicago, and they met uh, when uh, uh, when uh, uh, Paul was in the military. He met up there, and uh, they ended up moving back to Texas. Uh, Paul's family had, I th if I remember, they had a restaurant at the Greyhound bus station, and uh, I used to visit this town, like I said, regularly a very, very, how do you want to put it, uh, tip, pro-typical small town USA, 16,000 people, uh, very civic-minded. The people, uh, you know, had fundraisers and supported their town. Uh, and uh, they were very, very proud of the fact that uh, a vice president of the United States, John James Garner, not James Garner, John Garner, John James Garner is it? actor, John Garner, uh, vice president of the United States under uh, uh, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And uh, he, uh, he was from there. And uh, to see what happened in, the, in this town is, is just shocking. I mean, it could have been any town. It would have been shocking. But um, to think that this man uh, goes into, the, into this classroom and uh, kills 19 people is, is just un, un, unbelievable and uh, ununderstandable. And uh, uh, there's no doubt this is uh, someone that was not uh, healthy mentally, but this is evil. This is, this is plain evil. And I, I, again, I don't want to get into the debate uh, over gun control and things like that. I, I just, I do have a problem that uh, at 18 years old, this young person, um, could buy an assault rifle and hundreds of rounds of ammunition. ammunition. Um, I, I think there's got to be a better way to, to take care of these things. And, and from all angles, uh, not only from uh, that angle, uh, but also for uh, mental health. Uh, I wrote a couple things. I wrote a thing to my parish uh, expressing my, my, uh, hurt over what took place. And um, we kind of start off our kids with uh, cell phones and tablets. And uh, as they get older, we, we push them over to social media and isolation and video games. And then we wonder why there's problems in this nation. Um, why our young people are, are, are struggling. And, and I think we have a lot of the answer. Uh, like anything, anything uh, that has a, a positive thing. I mean, what we're able to do here with, with doing Bible studies online, I mean, uh, to teach classes online, to interact online, it's a great thing. Uh, but we were not created to live this way. Uh, we were created to have face-to-face, person-to-person, relationships with our families, their friends, a, a core group of people that support us. And um, we are, we're suffering because of this. So uh, I hope we begin to address the situation. Um, I, I don't want to hear uh, the rhetoric from either side. Uh, I'm very, very uh, upset 
that people are are twisting scriptures and using. Uh, I, I heard one person say that it is our God given right. In fact, if you were a real Christian, you'd own a gun. Um, I, I can't understand that. I can't understand. Uh, uh, you know, I, I know people that uh, are very very responsible gun owners, very good people keep their guns locked up, utilize them for what they utilize them for, whether it's hunting or, or target shooting. But uh, uh, just because you own a gun, you're not evil. And just because you don't own a gun, you're not evil. But to, 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 to be at both sides of this issue is, is very, 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 very disturbing. And um, anyway, uh, enough of my rambling here. I, I, please pray for our nation. Pray for the, the souls of the 19 people who lost their lives uh, unjustly uh, for no reason. Uh, young people, children, nine and 10 years old, their lives were snuffed out. And uh, pray for their families that have to endure this, and carry that burden for the rest of their lives. So anyway, we're going to get to a more positive message now. We're going to start our Bible study. And uh, on the last two chapters of the book of Acts, and um, stay, say our prayer in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Master who love mankind, make the pure light of your knowledge shine in our hearts. Open the eyes of our mind to understand your gospel, and plant also within us the fear of your blessed commandments, so that trampling down all fleshly desires, we may follow a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing all things that are well-pleasing to you. For you are the illumination of our souls and bodies of Christ our God, to be up, sent of glory, together with your unoriginal Father, your all-holy, good life-creating spirit, now and forever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. So, two weeks ago, we concluded chapter 26 of the book of Acts, and uh, Paul, having been held in custody for several years, has finally appealed again to Rome. The proconsul of the area of Festus uh, sends Paul to Rome. And uh, he's in, he even has a, a quick hearing before King Agrippa, and he begins to tell him about the message of Jesus Christ. And Agrippa says, you've almost persuaded me to become a Christian. Uh, and, and, and Paul says, I hope, I hope it does, and I hope it helps for other people too. Uh, in the end, uh, of course, he does not convert. Uh, King Agrippa basically says to the proconsul Festus, he says, this, this man, there's no reason for him to have been arrested, but he's made the appeal to go to Rome, and he's going to go to Rome. And that brings us into chapter 27. Chapter 27, after, uh, the, uh, after Paul being held in custody in Caesarea, is now going to go to Rome. And this going to Rome is uh, not without its uh, trials and tribulation, as, and it kind of uh, adds a, a little bit of an excitement there to the end uh, of, of Paul's uh, Luke's story about Paul's missionary efforts uh, and the founding of the early church with quite a, a, an intense, uh, uh, intense uh, flair, if you will. And we'll read about that, and then uh, in Paul's enter entrance into uh, entrance into Rome. So we're going to start here, chapter twenty-seven. We're going to go one through uh, verses one through uh, thirteen, twelve. And when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, now we should sail to Italy. Paul, uh, Paul is there. Luke is there. We. He's writing this. Paul, this is this is Luke's uh, description of what's going to take place. So Luke has been with him. So when we that we should sail to Italy, they deliver Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. So entering a ship of Andrimitium, we put to sea, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia. Aristarchos, a Macedonian Thessalonica, was with us. The next day, we landed at Sidon, 
and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. When we put to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And when they had sailed over the sea, which is off of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. There was a, there the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy, and he put us on board. When we had sailed slowly many days and arrived with difficulty off of Sinidus, the wind not permitting us to proceed, we sailed under the shelter of Crete off of Salmone. Passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near the city of Lasea. Now when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will, not, will, not, will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and owner of the ship than by the things spoken of Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also, if by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, opening toward the southwest and northwest and winter there. When the south wind blew, softly, supposing they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close to by Crete. So, um... Let me see here. I'm going to try and share my screen. Uh, let's see. Uh, for those of you, uh, for those of you that can't uh, that are on Facebook, this is the map that I put up uh, to announce today's Bible study. And I don't know if you can go back to that. But for those of you on uh, on uh, on Zoom, you can kind of see uh, where. Uh, see this beautiful, beautiful uh, map of uh, of uh, of the Mediterranean, and um, basically, and I've got to see if I can move this. Here we go. I got that. Okay. If you look at the right side of your map, you'll see an area in green. You'll see the word Syria, and if you come down, you'll see Judea, and then you'll see Jerusalem. Antipatris, that city uh, that's there up and to the left is where uh, uh, pretty much Paul had been uh, held imprisoned. And uh, you see Caesarea Maritima, uh, that's where Paul boards his ship to go to Rome. And the first leg of the journey on this one ship is for uh, the ship to first sail to Sidon. From Sidon, they go south of Cilicia and Pamphylia, and they come to Myra and Lycia. All right? And Mar Myra and Lycia is an interesting place, too, because that's where St. Nicholas is from, St. Nicholas and Myra. Uh, and uh, so what's going on here? Back to verse one, and we kind of got the uh, got to the, the the setup. So they're going to go to Italy, and this centurion by the name of Julius of the Augustan, or what is called the Imperial Regiment, is taking custody of the of the of the uh, of the prisoners. So they get the ship that's from Adramatium. Uh, I don't think you can, it's not on the map, but it's uh, along the coast there, I think. Uh, uh, I can't remember if it's in Cilicia or not. Anyway, uh, the ship is from this port, and it's probably doing just a little bit of uh, a ferrying, you know, taking people around and maybe some, uh, some goods and services. And they also mention... Uh, uh, that they're going to sail along the coast of Asia. And as I've told you before, typically sailing in those days, people hug the coast. Almost through the entire trip, uh, going from one place to another, you could see the coastline or you could see an island. And uh, they come to Sidon. They're, they're there for a couple days. And uh, uh, there from Sidon, they it says that 
the uh, centurion treated Paul kindly. He let him go out and get off the ship. He visited some of the brethren there, people that were uh, Christian. He met with them, received care from them. Perhaps they packed him some food. Maybe they gave him a, a, some clothes. Who knows? And from Sidon, they take off. And now this ship's journey ends in Myra. In Myra, uh, they now get another ship. They get off of the ship that they start out. Now they're on a new ship. This ship is from Alexandria. Now, if you look at Myra and you look straight down, you see the city of Alexandria. The north coast of Africa, Egypt, and you know, all the way to the left, to the west, was the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. They sent wheat uh, all over the, the, the empire. And the easiest way to uh, send the wheat was to go from Alexandria to Myra. So Myra was a main distribution point for the grain that would be sent, especially the grain that would be sent to Rome. So there they find in what is called what they call an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy. And it made sense that it was an Alexandrian ship because that's what they did. They shipped wheat from Egypt up to Myra, from Myra to Rome. So they get on this ship and now they go up the coast to a little to a to a small port city called Sinaitis. This should have been a fairly short trip. This should have been a, a very short trip. Um, but for some reason, the winds were against them. They were moving slowly, and it was difficult sailing. It shouldn't have taken too long, but it did. From Sinaitis, they now begin the journey west. They begin the journey west. They um, they were supposed to pass uh, underneath roads. If you see Sinise, you see roads, they were supposed to go underneath roads, but the winds kept them north of roads. Uh, I don't know enough sailing. I don't know about uh, the exact uh, sailing of these uh, situations here. But again, there were natural uh, ways, natural uh, ocean currents, whatever the case was, Luke puts, puts out there that they're not going the way they should have been going. And now they're struggling to get uh, beneath Crete on what is called the lee side, the, the island protecting them from the wind. And they come to Salmone, and with difficulty, they get to a place called Fair Havens, or also known as Good Harbor. And uh, it's a misnomer. It was not a very good harbor. It was not a place that they could uh, stay uh, too long, but they, they, they get to this area. And they get there uh, in verse nine. Now, when much time had been spent and sailing now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them. What fast? He's talking about the Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement, at least today, is like October 5 or 6. So this is when the winds and the weather changes in the Mediterranean. It's not easy sailing. So their goal is to make it to Phoenix from Fair Havens. As I said, Fair Havens was a misnomer. It was not a very, very good or safe place to park your ship for the three months that they needed to until the weather changed. So the goal of the owner of the ship and the captain was to go to, to Phoenix. And Paul advised them saying, man, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster, with much loss, not only of cargo and ship, but of our lives. So he's talking to the people there. And now here's this uh, philosopher, uh, uh, theologian slash evangelist. And uh, St. Luke says, nevertheless, 
No matter what Paul said, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship. Well, it makes sense. What does Paul know about sailing? Uh, we'll find out later things much more than we realize. But, uh, uh, it, you know, at, at first glance, you would trust the helmsman, the, the, the captain, so to speak, of the ship and the owner. And uh, Fair Havens was not suitable for winter. So now they're going to try and, and, and sail, as I said, to Phoenix. When the south wind blew, wind blowing, they figured this is going to be an easy trip because it's going to drive the ship right to Phoenix. And this is where you pick up chapter 14. But not long after, a tempestuous head of wind arose called Aphrocledon. Uh, the Greek word translated tempestuous is typhonos, which we derive the word typhoon. And it's, uh, 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 and the word here, Aphrocledon, can also be called a northeastern. Uh, this is not a good wind, all right? So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. Okay, you know, I guess what they're saying is that they could not go and stay a course that they wanted, but now they just had to let the wind drive them wherever they were going to go. And as this happens, they are running under the shelter of an island called Clauda, where we secured the skiff with difficulty. So... Instead of going up to Phoenix, the ship is now being driven further into the Mediterranean. Uh, they come underneath an island called Clauda. Maybe they wanted to protect themselves from the wind. They, they, we secured the skiff. The skiff was like a, a, a small boat that they used probably as a life raft. And uh, if they needed to make a foray off the ship into, onto an island, whatever that was. But it's almost like St. Luke is involved in, in lashing down this, this, uh, this skiff. And when they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship, fearing the less they should run aground on the Sirtis sands. They struck sail and so were driven. So the impression here is that they are running cables underneath the ship and literally tying the ship together, holding it together, that this rough ocean will not destroy the ship. Again, these were not uh, ships that were built for difficult uh, uh, you know, ocean going trips. These were, they hugged the coast. And um, uh, if you look way down to your left, you see Sirtis Major, they're concerned that they're gonna be driven onto these, uh, uh, onto the sandbars that are there uh, north, uh, north of uh, Serenica, Serenica. And uh, so they understand that they're not in good shape. Uh, and because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. They began throwing things off the ship, dumping some of their cargo. Because again, the, this, is, this is a heavy boat. It's a large ship, uh, probably very, very clumsy in the ocean. And, and they're doing whatever they can just to keep afloat. On the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Again, more of the weight of the ship, uh, some of the actual things that they used on board were thrown over. Now, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. So they're really, they're really worried. They think uh, um, they're not, unable to see the sun and the stars. They don't know where they are. They're in the Mediterranean somewhere, but they don't know where. And it's, it's like I said, everyone, everyone said, this is, this is it. And then we come to verses uh, 21 uh, through 26. But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart. For there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all and all those who sail with you. Therefore take heart, men, for I believe God 
that it will be just as it was told to me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. So what Paul says here is not so much Paul saying, I told you so. He said, you could have listened to me there. You didn't listen to me now. I was right when I spoke in Fair Havens. I'm right now. This is what's going to happen. Trust me, because this was revealed to me by an angel of my God, the God I serve. God told him, you must be brought before Caesar. So Paul is telling the people that's on his ship, that everything's going to work out. We're going to lose the ship. But we're going we're gonna to have to uh, beach this ship on a certain island. Verse 27, now when the 14th night had come, so they're driven by the storm for 14 days. They've not seen the moon, the stars, the sun. They have no idea where they are. After 14 days, as we were driven up and down the Adriatic Sea, not really the Adriatic, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's probably, uh, I think now it's called the Ionian Sea down there, but anyway, uh, it's, it's in, in their, in their uh, uh, understanding was the Adriatic, uh, but basically the Ionian between Crete and Malta. Um, about midnight, the solar soldiers sensed that they were drawing near some land. So they are, they have a feeling. And they took soundings and found them to be 20 fathoms. And when they'd gone a little further, they took sounds again, found them to be 15 fathoms. So the first time they, they, they take a, a they, they let out a rope and see how deep the water is, it's 120 feet. The second time, it's 90 feet. So it's obvious that they're 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 no longer they're they're moving towards uh, uh, something a, a piece of land. Then, fearing we, lest we should run again ground against the rock, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for the for, prayed for day to come. So what did they do? They 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 sense they're 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 nearing land. They let out four anchors off the back of the ship. And they do that because the way the ship is being driven, they want the, uh, the bow, the front of the ship, to point towards the land. So they put four anchors down the back. And as the soldiers were seeking to escape the ship, when they had let down the skiff into the sea under the pretense of putting out anchors from the prow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. So the sailors that ran the ship are now getting on the lifeboat and they're telling them, we're going to put out some more anchors. And Paul knew they were going to abandon the ship and just leave them there to die. So Paul tells the centurion and the soldiers, he said, if you don't get these guys back on board, we're, we're, we're dead. We're dead. So the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it fall off. They just get rid of it completely. So now the, the, the sailors are, are stuck on board. Verse 33, and as day was about to dawn, Paul implored them all to take food, saying, today is the 14th day you have waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. He said, you guys got to eat. We need our strength because the next part of this journey is going to be difficult. And when he had said this, he took bread gave thanks to God in the presence of them all, and when he had broken it, he began to eat. Um, this was a typical Jewish way of blessing food. Uh, nothing wrong with that. It has Eucharistic undertones, but there's no way uh, Paul would break the have Eucharist with people that were pagan. But he, he, he's trying to uh, impress them to eat and to strengthen themselves. They were all encouraged and also took food for themselves. And in all, there were 220, 76 persons on the ship. Like I said, this is not a small ship. It was laden with wheat, 
276 people on board. So when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and threw out the wheat into the sea. So they got rid of as much weight as they could off the ship. When it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they observed the bay with a beach onto it, which they planned to run the ship if possible. So they don't, they're really not sure where they are. They see a good place to beach the ship, and that's the plan. In verse 40, and they let go the anchors, left them in the sea. So they basically just abandon everything. And all there is is the boat. Meanwhile, losing the rudder ropes, they hoisted the mainsail to the wind and made for the shore. So they're just taking the ship as the wind will right onto the beach. But striking a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground and the prow stuck fast and remained unmovable. But the stern was being broken up by the violence of the waves. So they reached this spot. The, the, they can't go any further. Uh, the seas are really, really tough, and it's starting to break up the back of the ship. The soldiers' plan, verse 42, was to kill the prisoners lest any of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land. And the rest, some on boards, and some on parts of the ship. And so it was that they all escaped safety to land. So the soldier's first thing is that we've got to kill these prisoners because we're going to lose them. Centurion uh, has grown to uh, like Paul, impressed with Paul. He's not going to let that happen. He says, tells the people, if you can swim, swim to shore. If not, grab on whatever you can. Miraculously, 276 people are saved from this event. And now they find out where they are. And this is verse 20, chapter 28. Now, when they escaped, they found out that they that the island was called Malta. So they, for 14 days, were pushed from Crete south of Sicily to Malta. And there they, 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 they beached the ship. 14 days. I mean, and, and the ship, as Paul said, was destroyed, but everybody's life was safe. safe. Uh, we'll read a few verses here in, in, in chapter 28. And the natives showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. So these, uh, the word here, natives, the word should be barbarian. They were, the people of Malta, I think, spoke a Phoenician language. And because they did not speak Greek, they were considered barbarians by their race, barbari. So these uh, Phoenicians, these barbarians, showed unusual kindness. Paul was kind of surprised at what they did for them. They built fires, they took care of them as they were cold. And Paul, uh, you know, always was a worker, a tent maker. And, and, and to keep the fires going, he went and gathered wood himself. And that was happening three. But when Paul gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper, a poisonous stake, came out because of the heat and fastened onto his hand. So this poisonous stake now bites Paul. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer whom, though he has yet escaped to see, yet justice does not allow him to live. So they were thinking that this is the, uh, the, the real Hellenic aspect of justice. Uh, eventually the, the scales will balance out. And if you were a murderer, well, you're, you're dying because this, this, uh, this poison snake bit you. And, uh, and so you're getting your due reward, if you will. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. So the, the people of Malta are expecting Paul to just drop dead from this, this horrible bite. He just shakes it off and goes along his way. They, they, they're shocked. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Okay? First, they said he was a murderer. It says anyone that can withstand the bite of a, of a, of a serpent, uh, of a place of sake, it got, it got to be something special. In that region, there was an estate 
of the leading citizen of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. Publius was probably a Roman who had estates there, pieces of land, and you know he had the centurion there, important person, and he also had Paul, who was a Roman citizen, and they're all there. And uh, they, they, they took care of them for three days. And in verse 8, we're told that Publius's father was sick with a fever and dysentery. Paul went into him and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. They also honored us in many ways. And when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary. So Paul is still doing ministry. He's healing the sick. He's taking care of the sick. And once the word gets out, more and more sick people are brought to him. As they're ready to leave Malta, they, uh, they gave them all the things that were necessary. Verses 11 through 15. After three months, we failed in an Alexandrian ship whose figurehead was the twin brothers, which had wintered at the island. The twin brothers were uh, uh, sons of Zeus, uh, and they, they would have this on the front of the ship. They would do some sort of design, maybe ask for their protection or whatever it was. But that ship was there for three months because it was unsafe. And look how close. If you look at the map, they were very close to Italy, but they were there for three days, three months, because it was unsafe to travel. And you want, I'm going to take down this map now. Well, yeah, well, I'll, I'll leave it up. I'll leave it up. Um, and landing to Syracuse, uh, you see right there at the bottom of uh, Sicily, they stayed there three days. From there, we circled around and reached Regium. And after one day, the south wind blew, and the next day we came to Pioli. So they come to Regium, they're at the, the, the very tip of the boot of Italy. And in one day, they, uh, get to the port city uh, where the grain shipments were unloaded. It was an, an, one of the important ports uh, to the city of Rome, and they get off the boat there. When they enter in Tol Toloi, um, we found brethren, they said, and were invited to stay with them seven days. So for seven days at Toloi, they are there. There are Christians all over the empire by now. There, there are searches all over the empire, and they receive Paul. And now they begin the journey on foot from the port city up to Rome. And so we went toward Rome, and from there, when the brethren heard about us, they came and met us as far as the Appi Forum and Three Inns. So you see the Appi Forum and uh, the Three Taverns. These are a few days' journey from uh, from Rome. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. So these Christians are hearing, and probably they knew Paul was an important person. The next section, uh, starting in verse 16. Now when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. So now Paul is renting a place in Rome, uh, like a, an apartment or a flat. He only has one soldier with him at the time, at this time. Uh, they, they're not too worried about him. He, he's been with them enough to know uh, this guy's not a real problem. And, and what he preaches and teaches has, has nothing to do, uh, is not against the, the teachings of, of Rome. But anyway, he's there. And it came to pass after three days. So Paul settled in three days. And Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. As is typical with Paul, he comes to a town, he comes to a city. He's now in Rome. He calls the Jewish leaders together. It says in 17, so when they had come together, he said to the men and brethren, though I have done nothing against your people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem to the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, wanted to let me go because there was no cause for putting me to death. But when the Jews spoke against it, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, and not that I had done anything of which to accuse my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have called for you to see you 
and speak with you, because for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. So he basically tells them what took place. Uh, he was going to be released. The Jewish leadership in, in, in Jerusalem was against Paul. They would not allow the, the proconsul to, to free him, even though they saw no reason to keep him. Paul, in order to save himself, appeals to uh, uh, Rome, appeals to the emperor as a Roman citizen. And he says, that's why I'm, I'm here. For this reason, therefore, I have called for you to see you and speak with you. For the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. He's bound in a chain. He's, he's chained up because his out of his concern for, for Rome, I mean for Israel, for him to share the message, the saving message of Jesus Christ. Verse 21, then they, this group of Jewish uh, people, the, the Jewish community in Rome, then they said, and we neither receive letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren who came reported or spoken any evil of you. So we're not aware of any of this stuff. No one's telling us anything. But we desire to hear for you what you think. For it's concerning this sect. We know that it is spoken against everywhere. He says, we want to hear about you, about this Christian group, this sect. And we're aware of the fact that everybody talks against it. We want to hear what you think. Verse 23, so when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of the Moses and the prophets from morning until evening. So he's doing this all day long, and he's teaching them their own law, their own prophets, their own shared uh, law and prophets. And he's shown this is where Jesus is. As was the case in many places, is the same as in Rome, and some were persuaded by the things which they were, which were spoken, some disbelieved. So some of the Jews accepted what, what Paul had to say about Jesus, some rejected it. So when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had said one word. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah, the prophet of our father, saying. So he, he's basically saying that uh, uh, Isaiah uh, criticizes our own people. And this is the quote from Isaiah. Go to this people and say, hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will hear it. So for those Jews that rejected the saving message of Jesus Christ, Paul basically said, you guys are just too stubborn, too hard-headed. You're not going to hear this. It's time to give this message to the people that will, and that's the Gentiles, which he's already experienced, which he's already done, as we saw with his first three missionary journeys. And when they had said these words, the Jews departed and had a great dispute among themselves. So now... They are arguing within themselves. Again, as I said, some of the Jews accepted this teaching. Some of them did not. Some of the Jews accepted the message of Jesus Christ. Some of them did not. But uh, let's see here. Okay, so this is the situation in Rome, and the last two verses of the book of Acts. Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching these things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. And this is where he leaves it. This is how St. Luke ends the book of Acts. Paul, two years preaching and teaching Rome. We get 
bits uh, of, uh, of insight in, uh, in Philippians, another of his letters uh, in, in Philippians. Uh, he tells us that he writes to Philippians, he says, listen, I, I've been here for, for so long that I have cycled through because he was chained to one or two uh, uh, guards. The imperial guard were with him every day. He said that the fact I've been with here so long and every member of the guard has heard the message, the saving message of Jesus Christ. So he stays there. It was the intent of St. Paul to go to Spain from Rome. Uh, we don't, uh, we don't have uh, the, the, we have stories, but we don't have the scripture uh, as to him, his trial in, in, uh, in Rome in front of the uh, emperor. But there in Rome, Paul is uh, martyred for the faith, as is Peter, and uh, his, uh, his life comes to a close. So that's the book of Acts. Uh, again, kind of an exciting then there at the end with the, with the storm and the ship and the crash and, and then getting uh, them to uh, getting there into Rome where Paul will stay and preach and teach for two years. I pray that this has been a blessing for you. Uh, we will uh, uh, announce well in advance when we will pick up our Sunday evening Bible studies again. I, I thank you for listening. Please keep me in your prayers and uh, please pray for our nation, our church, our hierarchs, that, uh, that we do what is right by God and do the, the right things uh, so that uh, we are guided by the grace of the Holy Spirit to do what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ would have us do. God bless you. Once again, I want to thank uh, OCN for hosting me and hosting us. Uh, again, they are a phenomenal resource. And for those of you on Facebook, for those of you that are here on the OCN, on the Zoom, please, please, please uh, utilize this great resource. They do tremendous work. They need our support. We should support them as best we can so they can continue their missionary efforts to, uh, to pronounce uh, orthodoxy, not only to uh, the United States, it's, it's all over the world. And they have some amazing, amazing things. So uh, Noel, I want to thank you and everyone at OCN. I want to thank Father Chris uh, uh, Metropolis, who is now a neighbor, for, for hosting us and allowing us to do this. And, and we pray that uh, you have a blessed summer. Uh, good night and have a, have a great day.